compound interest, often hailed as the eighth wonder of the world, works like a financial alchemist, transforming your initial investment, the principal, into a burgeoning treasure over time. Here's how it works. You start with a sum of money. This amount grows annually at a certain percentage, known as the interest rate or compound growth rate. But unlike simple interest, compound interest reinvests the earnings, adding them back to the principal. This increased sum then earns more interest, creating a cycle of exponential growth. As time marches on, this compounding effect accelerates, much like a snowball rolling downhill, gathering mass. It's this phenomenon that can turn modest savings into substantial wealth, showcasing the potent power of patience and time in the realm of finance. Helene, you and Professor Harold Pollack wrote the book, The Index Card, Why Personal Finance Doesn't Have to Be Complicated. Where does compound interest rank when summarizing the most important personal finance advice on the back of an index card? It's pretty high up there. I forget where we actually had it, or I should say Harold put it, but it's fairly high up there. I mean, the idea is, of course, is that over time money grows, right? So, and the longer it has to grow, the bet the more it will grow. Because presumably, I mean, it's never a hundred percent, right? You know, there's always we, you know, there's always this idea the stock market grows X percent every year over time, and that's been true for a hundred years. But I'm always reminding people that can end at any point, right? So you have to put money aside, right? You have to know that. But at the same time, you know, the longer you have, the more likely it is to grow. And so, you know, one of the things that I, I think one of the things I think we all find so frustrating sometimes is the, you know, the most valuable time to get, you know, money aside is the younger you are, you know, in your early 20s, in your late 20s, in your early 30s, say. And of course, that is the time, I won't say you have the most expenses because you think you have the most expenses, but you don't. Um, you know, but it's the time when you don't totally, A, realize the value of putting that money aside. Second, it's the first time usually you have money at your disposal, aside from like your parents' allowance, right? And third, you know, when you're 25, it all seems like it's going to last forever. So there's this sort of like, oh, I want this or I need to do that. And it's kind of a hard thing to understand and explain that you know, this is actually the best time to put that money aside because this way you won't have to put as much money aside when you're 40, say, if you have X goal that you want to meet. Absolutely. Jordan, last time you were here, you said the pitfall is worrying about being perfect. When all you need to do is be good or even average, by buying reasonable investments with low fees over long periods of time, that's the way that we're going to have so many millionaires and multimillionaires that we might not know what to do with them. <laughs> Can you talk about like the difference between simple interest and compound interest? Well, certainly. I mean, what we're talking about is the difference of linear growth versus exponential growth. When we're talking about compound interest, Basically, it's the interest you're making off your interest, right? The minute you collect that interest, it's no longer interest. It's now principal. So the idea is we want our money to do the heavy lifting for us. Sweat equity is great. It's great to work hard and make money. But I like the kind of equity that doesn't require us to sweat. I like to put it into the bank, put it into investments and watch those investments grow and let the money do the hard work and not us. And that's why we need this exponential growth, because if we have linear growth, it's just not going to grow fast enough. But if we have exponential growth, that's where we see like the rule of 72, right? This idea that based on what percentage we make on the money, we can multiply that by the number of years and we get the doubling time. Let that money work for you. It's incredibly strong. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's stronger than we are. Right. So trying to figure out how long will it take for you to double your money? What rate of return do you need to achieve that? Michael, it seems like when it comes to the topic of compound growth, sometimes it's simplified. It's like, oh, you just invest and it's going to grow while you're sleeping. You... you you're keen on risk on, risk off. Can you talk about 
managing to avoid large losses and how that plays into the process of compounding? So first of all, just to be uh, clear, I, I, obviously Helene is right on the point about when you're young, you feel like it's going to last forever. So spend and don't worry about investing. I do think part of the discussion, and I'll get into the risk on risk off, is uh, should be focused around the idea of guaranteed compound interest versus uncertain compound interest. Okay, and what I mean by that is uh, not getting a guaranteed rate of return by investing in treasury bills or money markets or CDs, but the guaranteed rate of return of not paying the compound interest from credit card debt. Okay, so I, I, I often feel, and I think unfortunately in this environment, more and more I think young people, traders that are entering the marketplace. Uh, believe they can compound gains and take the chance by leveraging into equity markets, using derivatives, using leverage, uh, when they should probably be paying off that 23% you know, credit card balance on uh, on average, right? The guaranteed company of not having to pay that is really important. Um, now, on the drawdown point, you know, on this, the, it is true that, yes, equities do tend to have positive annualized returns, but the path with which it plays out is critical and to the extent that you can try to minimize large drawdowns obviously easier said than done being down less ends up resulting in most people being up more last two years as you know has been challenging for that because if you try to avoid uh, a drawdown in stocks the classic place that most younger people invest by doing that in bonds good luck you know you end up having a bigger drawdown in bonds than stocks the last two years i think have been abnormal so from my perspective uh, in general, the best way to compound in any kind of uh, uh, money uh, is by investing in something which already has had a drawdown. You're much more likely to avoid a drawdown after one has already taken place. Uh, and I think if investors, no matter what age, have that mindset, that's how they're going to win longer term. Mariko, as an investment manager and business coach, how do you explain compound growth to the people that you're working with? Um, well, I think there's, you know, usually a diagram is a really good way of, of, of showing it. So if you look at linear growth, um, to Doc G's point, you know, you're just going to grow a little bit. And when you look at, at compound growth, you have this parabolic kind of curve. Um, and the, the sums are so big that people pay attention. Um, I, I think, though, there's a lot of psychology, and I know we're going to touch on this, too, and, and Helene, you touched on that as well, that gets in the way of, of people see that and go, wow, but they still <laughs> don't realize right, the power, and we're all born with time. This is the thing. Nobody has an edge, right? We have a certain amount of time, and no matter where you are, where you come from, you have the power of time that you can harness. And like, this is the biggest leveling, level playing field, but people don't understand that. And I actually have, if you, if you bear with me, I have uh, the psychology money by Morgan Housel. And since, you know, Charlie, we were talking about Charlie Munger and, and Warren Buffett, he gives this example that Buffett had started investing when he was 10. And of course, you know, he's well in his nineties. By the time he was 30, he had a net worth of a million dollars, which is about 9.3 million today, adjusted for inflation. If he had started at age 30 and retired at age 60 with the same returns, 22% annual compounded growth rate, right? The, he, the difference, listen to this difference, by starting at age 10 and going on until his 90s versus starting at 30 and stopping at 60, it's a difference between $84.5 billion and $11.9 million. Mm -hmm. Okay, so part so the point that that Housel makes is a lot of Buffett's growth. Yes, twenty two percent compounding is amazing, but you know what? It's the decades and decades of time that really make the difference, and those decades are available to anybody who's who's younger. And you know, I think we all wish that we were, you know, when we were young, we had the wisdom that we've acquired through all the sort of you know difficult life experiences we've had. <laughs> and so it's kind of as an elder, you kind of want to sort of grab all the 20 year olds and go like, no, really, really believe me. <laughs> I just want to pipe up and say, I have two kids in my twenties so, and their twenties. So I know exactly what you're talking about on a very deep level. Um, <laughs> I sometimes have been known to actually take the example of something someone has bought 
or is thinking of buying and saying, you see this $300 purchase? Like this could be like $1,000 in like 30 years. <laughs> Do you want to give that up? <laughs> yeah, there's an opportunity cost because um, Shelby Davis, a very well-known money manager and philanthropist, he was at the Bank of New York when my father was there in the 1970s and 80s. And my father tells me stories about how Shelby wore sweaters with holes in the elbows because he wanted every dollar that he could that he could to be invested. He didn't really care about his appearance. And um, that's a valuable lesson. So I want to go to segment two.